If you're living on Earth, you have, at some point in your life, heard the phrase, The book is always better. It doesn't matter whether it's a movie, a video game, a stage play, or whatever. There will always be that one nagging bastard that ruins the fun by pointing out that they've read before. That's me. I'm that annoying bastard. Now, there's a lot of reasons why source material tends to outdo its adaptations, but that's a really, really long conversation for another time. That book adaptations often fail to capture the magic found within the original pages is one of the great failures of creative media, especially when you consider how many advantages a visual medium has over a bunch of lines of text. Which is why the fact that the I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream point-and-click adventure game is better than the short story that it spawned from is such a welcome surprise. The original I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream short story was published in 1967 and written by notoriously chill guy Harlan Ellison. It tells the story of five soul survivors in a post-apocalyptic world who are kept alive for no other purpose than to be tortured by a sentient supercomputer known as Anne. The story won a Hugo Award in 1968 and has since been adapted into a number of different formats, including a radio play and a comic book. The PC game was developed by Cyber Dreams and released in 1995. Ellison was intimately attached to the game, going as far as to write much of its story and dialogue, as well as stepping in to voice Am, and I mean, just listen for yourself. If the word hate was engraved on each nanoangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant. Ellison may have hated technology, but if he wasn't loving this role, then he was a sociopath. Actually, if we're being totally honest, he might have been both. Before I go any further, I just want to preface some of the more sordid aspects of Harlan Ellison's character. In case you missed the earlier joke, Ellison was as well known for his writing ability as his temper. The guy was a serious hothead and practically made a brand out of landing himself in hot water. Some of it was harmless in retrospect, such as the fact that he seemed to fight with people for the fun of it. Whereas other parts, including grabbing a woman's breast on stage at an award show, are a bit more problematic. He was dubbed the most controversial figure in sci-fi for a reason. Look, whether you think Ellison was a deranged genius or just a complete ass who practically begged to have his clock cleaned every time he opened his mouth, that's something for you to decide. It's not going to be discussed in this video. We're looking at I have no mouth and I must scream, and I have no mouth and I must scream only, damn it. Now, the purpose of this video is not to discuss the game itself. With how much this game has been talked about, you don't need me to tell you that the menu looks nice, that the voice acting is well done, or that its soundtrack, short as it may be, is one of the most underrated gems in gaming. There are plenty of videos on the internet that have done that. Go and watch some of them. Rather, I want to use this video to talk about why this game is better than the short story. What does it do that sets it apart from a collection of contemporaries that have failed to even match the works they draw from, let alone surpass them? And I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream flourishes in the fact that it lets the branches of its tree grow, rather than cutting them away. Let's start with the way in which it presents its story. The original text is told entirely from the point of view of one character, that being Ted. Ted was written as a painfully obvious unreliable narrator, owed to his own insecurities and the fact that he's been tormented by Am for decades. The game, in comparison, takes the player through five individual scenarios in which each character gets a day in the limelight. The puzzles that the player solves and the areas they explore are directly linked to the backstories of each character and serve to paint a more complete picture of them. The player's ultimate goal is to make it through each level while trying to redeem whoever they're playing as. No spoilers, as always, but Am didn't choose these five because they didn't have any baggage to bring along with them. Part of the genius of this game lies in the fact that, while you're supposed to do everything you can to help these characters find resolution, you don't really want to. Each and every one of these characters, with the exception of Ellen and maybe Gorister if you're feeling particularly forgiving, is completely horrible. They're exactly the type of people that deserve to be tortured by a hateful demigod for an effective eternity. The short story suffered from a lot of telling as opposed to showing due to the fact that it's Ted who explains everything, not to mention his characterizations of his fellow prisoners is decidedly born from jealousy and spite. Here, the atrocities that these characters have committed, or suffered, is well and truly on display, and figuring out how to navigate them can be a real challenge. It's really easy to screw up, which the game will be happy to tell you about when the color of your portrait changes. It doesn't shy away from what it sets up and forces the player to suffer through Am's twisted games, just as the characters do. 
I should point out as well that as dark as the finished product is, it was even darker in the demo stages. I'm not going to describe or show what cutscenes were removed from the final product, because I think YouTube might implode if I do, but if you have a morbid curiosity, you can look them up. There are plenty available on the internet. And it's not just the playable characters that get this type of treatment. Am was an omnipresent, all-powerful figure in the short story, but the fact that he can be beaten, evidenced by the player making it through each level, is proof that he, for as much as he has learned with decades for his AI to function, has flaws. The character undoubtedly served best by the game's expanded story and characterization is Nimdok. Nimdok was barely a character in the short story, to the point that it's easy to forget that he's even there. In the game, he's probably the worst of the bunch, and yet arguably the most important character, seeing as he is the one best suited to jumpstart defeating Am. Which is ironic, because the imagery in his chapter was so evocative, especially as it pertained to certain territories, that it was censored in those locations, which actually made it impossible to beat the game. Anyway, in comparison to the short story, there is an actual ending to the game. Again, trying not to spoil anything, but I think the ending of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is pretty well known at this point. It's another exercise in the story's depressive mire, and one of the best examples of a downer ending in literature. The ending you reach in the game, while far from happy, is worthwhile, and dare I say, hopeful? The short story leaves you sitting there wondering why you just subjected yourself to an assortment of psychological trauma, which, trust me, was Ellison's intention, while the game, after subjecting you to a very similar stain of trauma, gives you a cookie at the end of it. And I think it works really well. The entire buildup of the short story ends up feeling somewhat pointless as Ellison takes outright brazen pride in pulling the rug out from under you. And Ellison wanted to do the same thing with the game, believing during its production that it should be outright unwinnable. Though the developers, thankfully, convinced him of how bad an idea that was. The game is also better served by the fact that it removes some of the more zany aspects of the short story. Ellison was unabashed about the fact that he wrote for the purpose of shocking people, and there are some details in the text that are clearly just there to get a rise out of the reader. In my opinion, while I'm more a fan of critiquing works in relation to the time they were written, a lot of those details haven't aged very well today. The game is less of a shock piece and more of a sincere telling of torture, hate, and I do mean a lot of hate. And yes, as I mentioned earlier, redemption. What makes the PC release of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream so much better than the short story is that it doesn't adapt the text. Instead, it expands on what was present and breathes new life into the world, using the unique visual and interactive capabilities afforded by its medium to do so. Let's be honest, if this was a word-for-word -word adaptation of the short story, this game would be fucking terrible. Nothing sounds more unfun than going on an unwinnable quest in search of a can of peaches. The original release of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream was limited by its format. The entire story is 13 pages long. It's 16 pages. I don't know why I said 13, it says 16 in my script, but it's 16 pages. Also, this really was not deserving of an editor's note, but there you go. There's only so much you can do in that length. The game has no such limitation. The player is free to explore the landscapes and get a fuller understanding of just what it is they've gotten themselves into. The story was sad and upsetting, but it was very much left on a surface level. The game digs deeper, while appropriately remaining about as cheery as a back alley root canal. The I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream game is physical evidence that the folly of many a book adaptation doesn't lie in the fact that the magic of the text can't be recreated on screen. Rather, it shows that where most others fail lies in the fact that they don't use their advanced technology to bring something new to the stories, to present them in a way that isn't possible in a book. That, and you know, AAA companies are usually more concerned with making money, and they don't really care if they have to gut a narrative in order to satisfy their shareholders. You should both read the story of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, and play the game. I did both when I was 13, and I turned out completely fine. You'll be hard-pressed to find a better visual adaptation of a book. I promise. Now, I would not want you to think for a moment that I am not a grateful god. For 109 years, I've kept you alive so that I could savor your feelings of guilt over what happened to your wife. But now, to show my kindness, I'll give you a present in return for all the hours of pleasure you've given me. I'll finally allow you to kill yourself. <laughs>